episode 204, the last show of the year of Mighty Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. In this show, I would like to recap what I learned this year, both in health and in life. From what I can see, this year has been the most stressful and emotional for everybody. Between the masks and the lockdowns, which are still happening in certain parts of the world, just the separation that's occurred between family members and friends over different ideologies on health has been really interesting to see. I think that was the main agenda. It wasn't releasing a bioweapon upon humanity. The real weapon was the divide and conquer, which has been working and still works, especially in the natural health community. And I've really noticed that this year that people love to uh, fight and take people down and the whole cancel culture movement, which has been growing steadily for years. All of this is unhealthy behavior in my view. Uh, Healthy behavior is talking things out, not jumping to emotional reactions first before using logic and communication. And that is very rare nowadays. That's been my experience anyway. I really think that it's a combination of social engineering, the school system that we went through, the movies that we watched growing up. Now you have the Netflix series and all the things that People see on screens, even if they're not watching the news, they're still getting uploads of really unknown uh, subliminal messages. And then you combine that with chronic, severe nutritional deficiencies, everything from zinc, selenium, magnesium to vitamin E, vitamin C, retinol, vitamin K2, all of this combined really does a number on someone's mind and their amygdala and their ability to interact with other people in a healthy way. I think the health of a society could be measured by how we treat each other. And right now we're in the pits, we're in the depths of how people treat each other. There's just endless fighting and the divide and conquer is stronger than ever, probably stronger than it ever has been in the history of humanity. And instead of supporting people that are successful and genuinely want to help people, there is this spirit of jealousy that is so prevalent, not only in the health sphere, but in every profession. It's really interesting because the super jealous people didn't see how you got there. They didn't see the sweat, blood, and tears that led to this moment of seeming perfection. I think people look at my life living fully off grid. I have all the machines. I have multiple heavy machines. I have a snowmobile. I can experiment with pretty much any device or supplement that I think might have efficacy. But all of this started literally with a cigar session with my friend, David Kaziri, we're smoking a cigar and he said, Hey Matt, when you get home tonight at two or 3 AM to your RV, I want you to write down everything in the present tense as if it's happened already and you're living it and everything that you want. And when I talk about that, Some people might immediately go to Oprah Oprah Winfrey, The Secret, and all of that stuff. And maybe some of that applies. I'm sure there's tons of BS in there, maybe most of it. But I can tell you when I did it, it worked. Because within one year of doing that, about three quarters of that list was fulfilled. And then another couple years... And 100% of that list was fulfilled. And to me, that's not magic. I'm not stuffing animal innards inside of a bullhorn and burying that on the full moon. To me, this is just tapping into the power 
of emotions because right now everyone's tapped into their emotions in a super unhealthy way where they're easily triggered, which that is a sign of an imbalanced emotional body. If you're so easily triggered by something and you immediately jump to an emotional response instead of rationally thinking through the information and whether it's valid or not valid. And if you're one of those people, I challenge you, utilize this tool of affirmations. Maybe use one like, I am an emotionally resilient person and I am not easily triggered. If you're easily triggered, you're easily controlled. And just rewinding further back in my life before I lived in the RV and rented that out in the ghetto from my friends, Rich and Sarah, I started this whole health journey living with my parents. And that was in 2010 when I discovered raw veganism and green vegetable juicing. And I brought a Breville juicer and I started making fresh juice three, four times a week, making huge batches and then drinking it within 24 to 48 hours. And that was my intro to natural health. But I was relentless, even while I was going to private university, even while I was working three jobs, I was constantly experimenting. And the people I worked with, my coworkers, when I worked at Sport Chalet in the mall in San Diego, they saw me bringing in bunches of bananas for lunch. And in the break room, they would often see two bunches of bananas there and say, oh, that's Matt's lunch. So I had my fruitarian phase. I had a liquidarian phase where I was doing mostly liquids as meals, especially for breakfast and lunch. I would only eat once a day at night. I would do the blue green algae drink with chia seeds because supposedly that was a complete source of protein, according to some vegan authorities at the time. And it was a great experiment. I'm really glad that I did it. Because I was able to tell the difference in how I felt with all of these different lifestyles, whether I felt more airy or stronger or more grounded. I really tested the waters with so many different protocols and nutritional programs. And that really helped build the foundation for me to help people better because I could shortcut them. If they were thinking about going on a protein free, diet, like a fruitarian diet, I can tell them the importance of amino acids, or I could tell them the importance of fat soluble vitamins because my friend's teeth fell out from going fruitarian and really just saving people's lives from a lot of experiments that sound good on paper, but don't apply to real life. And we all have this ability to save people time and potentially save their life just by sharing your own experience. One thing I've noticed this year was a this or that mentality. And I think it's really easy for human psychology to go that direction. It's either iron overload or iron deficiency. It's either whole food vitamin C or ascorbic acid. It's this this or that mentality where people have lost the nuance of both being a possibility. And when I changed my mind this year on four things, cod liver oil, iron, ascorbic acid, and zinc, it caused the biggest stir in this health community because the people that have built their brands, their reputation off of these ideas that zinc is toxic, that ascorbic acid is toxic, that you should never ever supplement iron. When I'm coming out with research that nobody's looked at from college textbooks by Robert Crichton, the Dean of Iron Biology himself, and people are just regurgitating one health guru, which tons of people do on social media, they feel attacked because their integrity is showing. They didn't do their own research. They took somebody's word for it. And we've all been there. I admitted that. 
we're all prone to it. We're all human beings. We all make mistakes. And a huge mistake is taking a health guru's word for it because they have a health program or they've been studying health for you know, 20 years or they've read more scientific studies than you have. None of that means that they are right necessarily because everybody is selling something. That's really the black pill. Everybody's selling something, whether it's supplements, their training program, their eBooks, their coaching program, their message selling themselves. When I changed my mind on those topics, I got viciously attacked, viciously nonstop. And it was from the people that are insecure because they didn't actually question their own beliefs. I had an incentive to not change my mind about vitamin C. For those of you that are new to this topic, there's a raging debate that has been going on of whole food vitamin C, quote unquote, which doesn't exist, versus ascorbic acid, which is supposedly toxic, supposedly it's just the shell of vitamin C. And this is being promoted wildly for the last 10 years off of a few blog posts. There's actually no scientific study to back up their claims, yet it is a very popular belief system. And that's all it is. So go back and listen to my latest podcast on ascorbic acid, where I really break down the science and the truth about vitamin C. So that's all for the philosophical talk. I just want you guys to be aware that there's so much politics involved with this health information that it's really sad actually, because people are just looking for the truth. And then you have all of this infighting of people trying to protect their reputation because they look silly because of the research that I'm sharing that completely contradicts their entire message. So right now I'm going to go through all the things I changed my mind on. I already touched on ascorbic acid a little bit, but I'm going to go in chronological order for the year 2022, the order of events that occurred. It started with cod liver oil. This was back around February, March, and it was super cold here in Idaho where I live. And I'd just been through a really stressful time of moving and a lot of things in my personal life. But I noticed that I was much less resilient to cold than I was even the year prior, even six months before then. And I thought maybe it's protein deficiency. So I started eating much more steak. I thought maybe it was a thyroid deficiency. So I started to focus on thyroid and everything I could possibly do to support that. That didn't work. And then I came across cod liver oil, even though it contains PUFAs, which I've been talking about and studying for the last several years. And I was really hesitant to include it because of the omega-3 fatty acids within it, the DHA and EPA. But I tried it because of that vitamin A component, which I, I've heard so much about that has so many effects on human physiology, one of which is to actually increase cold tolerance. And in fact, that's exactly how the Vikings did it. So within a week, of supplementing Rosita cod liver oil, I would go outside on my homestead to do my chores, to tend to the chickens and my goats. And I didn't feel that sting from the cold anymore. It was such a immediate effect from supplementing cod liver oil. And granted, I was taking a lot of it. And that's, I think, why it only took a week to recover from years and years and decades of vitamin A deficiency but I felt it so quickly and that really surprised me. And I also felt a lift in my energy, substantial lift, which now I see because I was iron deficient, retinol could really help while somebody's iron deficient and all of the other compounds in it. I mean, it is technically a whole food supplement and it is completely an ancestral supplement that humans, especially in cold climates like Norway have been consuming for centuries. Actually, this morning, someone asked me my thoughts on vitamin A toxicity, and that's 
a frequently asked question I get probably several times a week uh, because there's this pervasive message out there that it's really easy to get too much vitamin A and that's toxic to the body. And here is all these studies to back it up. To me, studies are interesting and fun to read and useful, but people like to debate and battle using these clinical studies. And to me, that's just a never ending merry-go-round that just never stops because you can go back and forth and really find a study to support anything. And the question is, are they controlling for every possible variable? And the answer is a resounding no. You cannot control for every variable in a study. Therefore, the results in every study could potentially be flawed. And I think that's really important to remember that these are more just like guideposts. They're not gospel. And our experience is king. Our experience with the supplement or protocol or a lifestyle or whatever it is, that is really important to pay attention to, not stuff on paper. So my experience with cod liver oil was it was anti-freeze for me. I didn't freeze up like a ice cube going outside my door in Idaho here. I actually felt like I was becoming like Wim Hof just from supplementing cod liver oil. And maybe that's because vitamin A supports the thyroid. Although the pro-metabolic people would say that the PUFAs inhibit thyroid function. So I was just putting myself into hypothyroidism. You get into all these rabbit holes, all these debates. I would say just ignore all that noise and focus on your experience. So I've had a really positive experience with cod liver oil, just the Rosita brand. And I started with the liquid and I was slugging back about a bottle every five days. That's what my body was asking for. But eventually it started to burn my throat where at least once a day, it would be this really uncomfortable uh, burning feeling in my throat. And it's kind of like drinking olive oil. Uh, it's, it's spicy just to take the straight cod liver oil in the liquid form. So I switched to the capsules, which is a smaller dose. A serving size is three capsules, but you really have to take a lot of those to equal, you know, taking swigs of the liquid. So I might go back to it if I can figure out a technique or maybe coating my throat with something first before I take a swig from the bottle. But that was super easy and convenient for me. I would just go to the fridge, pull out the liquid bottle, set it on the counter, let it warm up for a couple minutes, which you're supposed to do with the liquid, take a swig straight from the bottle, and then put it back in the fridge. And that's the ideal way if you're going to take the Rosita liquid. The capsule is definitely more convenient, obviously easy to travel with, to throw in your bag, whatever. And I'm taking a ton of those right now, currently maybe 12 to 20 capsules a day, sometimes more. I'll probably switch back to the liquid just because that's a lot of gel caps to be consuming. But it's definitely something to try if you're iron deficient, or really you're dealing with any health condition that involves skin, lungs, scalp, bone issues like osteoporosis. It, there's so many areas that affects even fatigue. If you know being diagnosed with chronic fatigue, that could largely be a vitamin A deficiency because retinol itself is actually an electron carrier, kind of like the quinone vitamin K2 that I sell purely K for MitoLife. I think when it comes to fatigue, people often forget about the vitamins and not just the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, but the water soluble ones, the B complex vitamins, vitamin C, they all play a really important role in making us feel good and having energy. So the next thing I questioned after cod liver oil was vitamin C. And I briefly explained that before, so I'll just move through this one quickly. But essentially, I had an eye injury. I was limbing 
branches off of a tree in my yard and I didn't wear eye protection, which was stupid decision. And I had wood shavings raining down on my face and it actually ended up scratching my cornea. So I had what's called a corneal abrasion, which was super irritating, painful, uncomfortable for about three days straight. But I was trying a lot of things because whenever I get an injury or an experience like that, I take it as an opportunity to experiment, especially with MitoLife products. So I was taking quite a bit of niacinamide, which really targets the eyes. And there's tons of studies on nicotinamide slash niacinamide. They're synonymous terms assisting with various eye conditions. So I was making sure to take that every day, at least three grams. And I was experimenting with vitamin C because vitamin C has a huge connection to ocular health. So I was taking whole food vitamin C at first because this was during my transition in philosophy and it wasn't doing anything. It had no relief, even taking mega doses of whole food vitamin C. And so I broke down, I started taking ascorbic acid and immediate relief, like within hours. And the more vitamin C I took, the better I felt. And on day four, I was fully recovered. And the ophthalmologist that I went to said it would probably take a week or so to heal. And I healed in almost half that time. And I attribute that a lot to AA, ascorbic acid, which is another word for vitamin C. The second anecdotal story, I got COVID three times this year. Uh, the third time was traveling and I was around a lot of people. And actually some of the people that I was with uh, after the trip took it back home as well. And they felt exactly the same way, the full body aches, um, the loss of smell, taste. Fortunately, I didn't get that. I only had that once in the three times this year when I had it, but I definitely believe it's real. It's definitely different from a normal cold or flu. And you definitely need a strategy to bounce back from it. My main strategy this time around was using ascorbic acid. And when I say megadose ascorbic acid, I think that puts a picture in people's mind of taking a whole bunch at once, once or twice a day. But that's not a really effective way to use ascorbic acid because being a water soluble vitamin, it will spike your plasma levels and then come right back down. Same with the B vitamins. So the trick with B complex or ascorbic acid is to take small doses consistently throughout the day. So in the case of fighting an infection, utilizing vitamin C, what I was doing was taking it every 15 to 30 minutes. And I would take my MitoLife vitamin C product with polyphenols. I would take minimum four capsules, usually eight capsules at once, which ends up being a lot of pills throughout the day. If you wanted to, you could open those up into water and down it that way if you just don't want to consume that many pills. But I like the bamboo silica. I like its effects on aluminum and its memory enhancing effects. So I don't mind consuming that many capsules, but it made a huge difference. Add a little zinc to that. The other fat soluble vitamins, I was keeping up with my normal routine of the cod liver oil, the MitoLife vitamin E, MitoLife K2. I was taking B complex from lifeblood and the MitoLife vitamin C. So all the vitamins were covered. And then on the mineral side, I was covering my bases there with all of the usual stuff. The MitoLife beef liver, the oysters, the shilajit, that covers a lot of the mineral side. And of course, eating actual food helps a lot too. I'm still enjoying the Kintone hypertonic, especially when I didn't have an appetite when I was fighting that thing. So I was popping vials of that 
orally every two to three hours or something like that. And it was a really quick recovery. And I mostly credit the ascorbic acid. So one serving of the Mitolife vitamin C is 600 milligrams. That's two capsules, which to some people is a lot. But if you look into the work of Kleiner, Linus Pauling, a lot of the greats that studied ascorbic acid, you'll find that's not really that much. So I'll often take four capsules at once, which ends up being 1.2 grams or 1200 milligrams. But when I was dealing with COVID, I was taking 2.4 grams or 2400 milligrams every 15 to 30 minutes, which really adds up over the course of the day where it's really easy to get from 20 to 30 grams of ascorbic acid. And the gut bacteria is eating it up. It's loving it. Your cells are eating it up. Your mitochondria loves ascorbic acid because it regulates ROS production, reactive oxygen species. I want to quickly touch on the oxalates thing because that's really been trending uh, the latter half of this year that taking several grams, like I mentioned, of ascorbic acid is going to give you kidney stones. So I want to reference this journal, Canadian Medical Association Journal, Volume 132, from 1985. And the article is Ascorbic Acid and Kidney Stones. Over the past 10 years, the idea that ingestion of ascorbic acid in large doses causes kidney stones has been, become established. By constant repetition, this idea, based entirely on conjecture, has been enshrined as a fact. The same thing happened with the erroneous theory that ascorbic acid destroys vitamin B12. The belief that large doses of ascorbic acid can cause kidney stones arose following a few reports that ascorbic acid was partially metabolized to oxalate and that megadoses of ascorbic acid caused increases in serum and urine oxalate levels. Briggs and colleagues reported a man who had a tendency to produce excessive amounts of oxalate. They postulated that the risk of forming oxalate stones might be increased if he took large doses of ascorbic acid. While these papers provided the foundation for the common belief that ascorbic acid might cause kidney stones, no such event has been reported, even though millions of people take substantial doses of ascorbic acid each day. Now, it turns out that the apparent increase in the urinary excretion of oxalate was due to the laboratory method used for measuring oxalate. According to Faturi and colleagues, ingestion of 8 grams of ascorbic acid daily for 7 days had no effect on serum levels or urinary excretion of oxalate. Those who did find an increase in urine oxalate levels used a method that involved heating urine for 30 minutes at 100 degrees Celsius. But Faturi and colleagues used a method that did not require heat and observed no significant increase in urine oxalate levels. They also found that heating urine that contained ascorbic acid caused the conversion of ascorbic acid to oxalate. They concluded the increases found by two previous authors would seem to have been due to in vitro conversion of ascorbate to oxalate during the assay procedure, rather than any increased in vivo production of oxalate from the vitamin. Yet the myth that ascorbic acid may cause kidney stones persists in 1984, months after Futuri and colleagues' paper appeared. Al-Hadef and associates cautioned that excessive intake of vitamin C may be associated with the formation of oxalate stones. Of the six accompanying references, not one is to an original paper. All are textbooks that usually refer to others' views. Soon we will have a massive bibliography of references to authors referring to one another about a theory unsupported by experimental evidence. Kaboom, right? So a lot of these online 
scare myths. I've gotten caught up in several of them. They're very convincing. I get it. But we have to be very careful when we demonize supplements or tools that can be extremely useful in someone's healing journey. Researching these nutrients in depth this year has really opened my eyes to the idea that no supplement is inherently toxin. The dose alone makes it a toxin. Now, the way they're doing things with liposomes and micelle technology and coating these nutrients in like the squirt oral supplement bottles. I really question the safety of those, let alone the efficacy, but that might be where the danger zone possibly begins. I don't take any liposomal supplements. I don't believe in them. I think they're overpriced and not worth the money. But it really takes the stress off to walk into a health food store and you go to the supplement section and it's not like a war zone where you're like, this is toxic and that's toxic. And we see that happening now on social media with the produce section at the grocery store. And they'll point to lectins or oxalates or phytates or all these plant defense chemicals, quote unquote where they're missing the context of all of the anti-cancer compounds and all of the beneficial compounds found in green leafy vegetables or vegetables in general. So we went from cod liver oil, that was the first awakening this year, and then it was ascorbic acid, which I've lowered the dose since healing from COVID, but I'm still taking it consistently and some days more consistently than others. But when I remember, I try to take it every hour. And I do notice that it has been improving my overall gut health. I feel less bloated in general. Ascorbic acid is a weak acid. A lot of people from stress alone have low HCL, low stomach acid. So just taking this weak acid consistently, it's my theory that it is super beneficial for digestion. And there is research to support that your intestinal bacteria love ascorbic acid. And that is an argument for regular ascorbic acid versus liposomal. Because I do not support liposomal. Liposomal will bypass your gut bacteria and they don't get any of the benefit. So the next thing I started to question was zinc. And this was largely because I was taking a substantial amount of copper sulfate as an experiment. And I noticed that my hands started turning a different color. I believe they were turning blue. And so I started to take the cofactor shortly after I started taking a ton of copper sulfate. I added in ascorbic acid and zinc. And I noticed that my hand went from blue to red. And I later learned that ascorbic acid changes copper two into copper one. And there's a whole big heated debate on whether copper two or copper one is better. And I think it's splitting hairs if you have ascorbic acid coming in, which will change copper two to copper one, if that is the more superior form. But I felt a lot better taking ascorbic acid and zinc. So what I ended up doing is just dropping the copper, uh, well, the mega dosing of it, getting back to a modest you know, two milligrams of copper bisglycinate a day, which even if you have copper overload or copper toxicity, that can be helpful because it's always about a balance of nutrients. So if you're taking 100 or 150 or 200 milligrams of zinc a day in isolation, you still need copper in there, even if you have copper toxicity to, to balance out that ratio. So I cut the copper completely, the copper sulfate, and I stuck with the zinc and ascorbic acid. And I just noticed I was more grounded, more clear-headed. I was sleeping better. My energy was better. My mood was better. My skin looked better. Everything just seemed better with ascorbic acid and zinc in my life. I would not be surprised if I was deficient in both for my entire life. So I started diving into the zinc research. Obviously, Carl Pfeiffer has written a lot about zinc 
I like those old school nutrition books and does have a heavy, you know, copper toxicity message in a lot of these zinc books. And I wish they had more of a balanced approach because a lot of the pro copper people think that zinc is the absolute devil when in fact we need both for optimal health. So I've been experimenting with multiple different forms of zinc, aiming for at least 100 milligrams a day of zinc, but sometimes more. And I tried the citrate gummies, and I think all of the other things in the gummies didn't make me feel too good, so I stopped consuming those. And for the most part now, I'm just using zinc bisglycinate. I really like the bisglycinate form of minerals. And also this other form that I'm coming out with, with MitoLife uh, quarter one of 2023 that I'm really excited about. But I'm realizing this COVID cocktail that has been promoted since the inception of this thing, which is ascorbic acid, zinc, vitamin D, and then sometimes throwing quercetin in there and some other things. It wasn't that bad. It's just that it's missing all the other stuff. What about vitamin E? which is essential for lung health. What about vitamin K2, which takes a hit with COVID? What about retinol, which takes a hit with COVID? You could look up studies on fat-soluble vitamins and COVID, and it drains them all. What about the B vitamins? Now, I think it would have been more helpful if they said A, D, E, and K, C, and B, and then what about your minerals? Magnesium, sodium, potassium, I guess it's too much to put in a sound bite, so that's why they <laughs> didn't do it. But I think missing selenium in an immune stack is is ridiculous and makes no sense. So one little experiment, if you want to try it, is taking zinc right before bed because it actually improves sleep in many people. So I've been taking 20 milligrams right before I go to sleep and tracking my sleep with the Aura Ring. And it seems to make a difference on the nights I take it versus the nights I don't. Then the last thing I questioned this year was iron being toxic. And I think of all the things that I changed my mind on this year, that was the most triggering to people. Just because the argument is so convincing that everybody has iron overload and iron deficiency anemia doesn't exist, especially if... You're of the conspiratorial mindset and, you know, there are real conspiracies, obviously, like all the history we've been taught was completely false, but that doesn't mean that absolutely everything we've been taught is false. I just see people swinging too far one way on that pendulum and getting very ungrounded. So on the iron topic... Check out my podcast that I did with Caitlin Hardigan. We talked about her iron protocol and the reality of iron deficiency in the world. And yes, just because the World Health Organization said that it's a real problem doesn't mean that it's not a problem just because of how the last two years went. I think, you know, again, swinging too far on that pendulum you can end up with a very ungrounded perspective. So I talked about my experience with iron in that show pretty in depth, but just as a recap, I was vegan slash vegetarian for a good two thirds of my life, maybe a little bit more. And I grew up not eating much red meat. I was more of a chicken kid growing up. I liked, you know, chicken nuggets and pepperoni pizza and stuff like that. I wasn't eating steak or ground beef. And then I got into blood donation. And for two years, I, you know, quote, built up my iron recycling system with vitamin A from beef liver alone and copper. And, you know, I cut out all the supposed toxic supplements completely. And I was doing it by the book. And I wasn't seeing a dramatic improvement in my overall health. And so I experimented at that point with blood donations and I only did two. And the first one, I felt incredible 
I still haven't figured out why that is. If I offloaded maybe some excess copper from my liver that I had too much of. And I felt really good. But then the second one, I felt super fatigued immediately after the blood donation. And that really has not gone away completely. It has been getting better slowly since my last donation, which I think was April or so of this year. But I was already in subclinical iron deficiency. I didn't have low hemoglobin because obviously I could donate blood. But I had 12% iron saturation and relatively low ferritin, which for some people is under 100, which mine is and has been ever since I measured it. So when I started diving into Robert Crichton's books on iron, I was shocked that nobody for the past two years ever taught me this stuff, even though that was the focus of the discussion was, was iron physiology. No one talked about three stages of iron deficiency, which is really critical to know, especially if you're going to go out willy-nilly and donate blood. If you don't have iron to give, then it could potentially wreck your health. And I suspect that I already had low bone marrow iron stores. And then I went to donate blood and it just wiped me out. I mean, talk about chronic fatigue. So to cure my fatigue, so to speak, I utilized zinc, ascorbic acid, and iron in the form of iron bisglycinate. I experimented with heme iron, polypeptide, various different forms. And it's pretty rough because I noticed constipation even taking it once a day. And then I tried to look into infusions. With those, you can really bypass a lot of those negative effects of oral iron supplementation and just get right to the root of the problem and build your ferritin back up. So far, I've been unsuccessful in finding that for myself. I might have to travel out of state to do it. I just haven't had time to to research that in depth and and try to lock that in. But I'm sure that it would increase the amount of energy that I have because you need iron to make ATP. So if you've been following my work for years, you probably follow it along with this entire show. If you're new to a lot of this stuff, most of it probably just went over your head or seems super advanced because it is. We're really splitting hairs here when we get into the details of these different supplements. But to me, that's really where the effect is. It's not just a matter of buying a supplement and putting it in your cupboard. It's knowing why you're taking it, especially in the context of where you've come from. Like I said, I came from the vegan vegetarian lifestyle. That created some severe deficiencies. I mean, not only iron, but zinc, selenium, all the fat subvitamins, retinol, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K2, getting into the B complex and vitamin C, which is all the stress that we've had, public school system and all that BS. My perspective is that most people have several nutrient deficiencies, subclinical, maybe they have some symptoms here and there that they're not tying to an ascorbate deficiency or B-complex deficiency or vitamin K2 deficiency, but there's this chronic deficiency and they're not taking the right supplements. They're just taking the ones that they saw on the doctors or Dr. Oz, just your normal fish oil, turmeric, all the basic supplements, maybe a vitamin D. But when you get someone on the right combination of supplements. And I've seen this over and over. I've gotten thousands of messages about this, that it totally changes a life. It changes how someone interacts with people in their home, their coworkers, their productivity, their mindset, their creative drive. Everything improves with the right supplement stack for the individual. 
And I don't think that you necessarily need to individualize it by genetics. I don't even think that's the first step. I think the first step is looking back at your past. Did you do crazy diets like I did? Crazy experiments? Did you not like meat growing up as a kid? Did you lick a mercury thermometer? Did you have mercury fillings? Did you interact with lead paint? I mean, there's all these things to look back on that we just forget. I know sometimes I'll remember things from my childhood and make a connection of why that created a deficiency that I'm now supplementing to fix. It's really fascinating and it's free. All you have to do is sit there and think about your previous years here on earth. So that's all for my rant for this end of the year show. It's been quite a ride and I think it's been super stressful for everyone past couple of years. I would focus on not taking life too seriously. Like I said earlier in the show, working on not getting triggered as easily, working on supporting your nervous system with proper nutrition and supplementation and share this information with your family and friends because it's truly life-changing. My website, you can find at matt-blackburn.com. My CLF protocol is up top. And if you click on shop, you can see all of my recommended products. Uh, Bathing Evolve just released a new amino acid bath bomb. I think it fizzes for 20 minutes, which is pretty incredible. Well, it's actually infused with essential amino acids. So it's great to recover after a hike or a hard workout. I just added the salt booth and halo generator to the site. Just five minutes a day in that thing has had incredible effects for my overall health. Totally opens up my sinuses and helps me breathe better. I am a huge fan of dry salt therapy, uh, sometimes called halo therapy. So keep an eye out on that site because I'm constantly adding products to it. And if you go to mitolife.co, that's also a great place to Christmas shop. Dissolve it all just came back in stock. That is the systemic enzymes. That's a really broad acting supplement that pretty much everyone can benefit from because everyone has scar tissue to some degree in their body. So these are proteolytic enzymes that circulate in the body for several days, breaking down excess fibrin aka scar tissue it also breaks down necrotic debris in the blood and just has systemic benefits for every organ tissue and gland in the body and then the magnesium will be back just before christmas time so keep an eye out for the mag atp returning and there are some exciting products in the works uh, one of which is not available right now on the market And it's an animal-based supplement that will help improve sleep. And with the MitoLife drinking water filter, people have been asking about that for a few years because it's been in the works for a few years. Finally have a definite release date. That will be March of 2023. So if you've been looking for a great under-counter water filtration unit, where the filters are really easy to change. It's really well built. It's high quality. That is coming out very soon. And with that, I'm going to wrap up 2022 for Mito Life Radio. I'm really looking forward to my vacation for the rest of December. I'll see you guys the first week of January. I hope you have a great Christmas and a great new year. Stay supercharged. Mm-hmm.